Hello everyone and welcome back to the program. The most remarkable fulfillment of biblical prophecy in modern times was the sudden and dramatic rise of the two mightiest of world powers. One, Great Britain, forming the greatest world empire ever, and the other, the wealthiest, most powerful nation on earth today, the United States of America. These two peoples came with incredible suddenness into possession of more than two-thirds, nearly three-fourths, of the cultivated wealth and resources of the whole world. This sensational spurt from virtual obscurity in so short a time gives incontrovertible proof that God's Word is divinely inspired. On today's program, we'll look at the fabulous inheritance God promised to bestow upon the latter-day descendants of the two birthright tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. The Trumpet Daily. In the book of Genesis, we learn that God made an unconditional birthright promise to the great patriarch Abraham, and God then re-promised that birthright to Isaac, and then again to Jacob, whose name God changed to Israel. You can see that in Genesis 35. And then in Genesis 48, that's where we'll start our study today. Go and get your Bible so that you can read along. We've got lots of verses to get through today. But in Genesis 48, Israel, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, he blessed his two grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And he said, let my name be named on them. Let's notice that again in Genesis 48. And we'll start in verse 16. It says, The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. This is the, in the middle of the blessing, the prayer over these two lads. Bless the lads and let my name, that's Israel, the name Israel, let my name be named on them. Speaking of Ephraim and Manasseh and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And so, firstly, you see that the blessings, or this birthright, was passed on down to both. Not just one of the grandsons, but both of them, Ephraim and Manasseh. There was a blessing put upon them jointly, and then you can put other verses together with this and see how that there were some very specific blessings that each of them would have individually as well. But both of them took on the name Israel. Now, let me, uh, let me give you a quote from the United States and Britain in Prophecy. This is the book that we'll offer to you freely today. Here's what Mr. Armstrong said in the book. Thus it is that many of the prophecies about Israel or Jacob do not refer to Jews or to any of the nations that are today the descendants of the other tribes of Israel. He says, mark that well. Few indeed are the clergymen, theologians, or professed Bible scholars who know that today. Many refuse to know it. He says further, together the descendants of those, uh, these two lads, Ephraim and Manasseh, were to grow into the promised multitude, the nation and company of nations. These national blessings are poured upon them jointly. These are the collective blessings which the lads together received, but not the other tribes. And so there's dozens upon dozens of prophecies in the Bible end time prophecies about Israel. Mr. Armstrong makes a lot of points in, uh, in that passage. But first we should note that when the Bible talks about Israel in the end time, it's not even talking about the Jews. It's talking about these two peoples, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, as, as respect to the blessings, bless these lads, you can see what we just read there in Genesis 48. You can go back to Genesis 35 and verse 11 and see where uh, they were to be a, a great nation and a multitude of nations. These two. Now let's go over to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 26. God, as I said, God uh, promised these, these birthright blessings to Abraham uh, unconditionally, and then he re-promised them to Isaac, and then again to Jacob, and yet... They never were fulfilled anciently, not in ancient Israel. And so why is that? Why is that? Why didn't ancient Israel receive all of these, these promised blessings? Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, initially, they were right there in those 12 tribes. Why didn't they receive all of those blessings then? 
Well, to answer that, we need to come over to this pivotal chapter. Mr. Armstrong called this basically the, the basic prophecy of the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 26. And this prophecy, there's duality here. It pertains to our day today. But first, let's just note what happened anciently with ancient Israel. This is Leviticus 26, verse 1. It says, You shall make no idols, nor a graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths, verse 2 says, and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Eternal. This is Moses, God inspiring Moses. Now we're moving ahead in the story. God inspiring Moses to tell the Israelites, look, these are the two test commandments. We're here to uphold and obey all of them, of course. But these two test commandments, don't bow down to idols and keep God's holy days. Keep God's Sabbaths. Now notice an important start here to verse 3. It says, if, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then... And what follows is all of the blessings that God would bestow upon these people, these ancient Israelites. If you do this, if you keep my commandments, walk in my statutes, then I'll give you all of these birthright blessings. But you have to take note of that that, uh, big little word, if. If you do this. In other words, it was conditional for ancient Israel. He says here, in this central prophecy, God reaffirmed the birthright promise, but with conditions for those of Moses' day. The birthright tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh were then with the other tribes as one nation. Obedience to God's laws would bring the vast national wealth and blessings of the birthright not only to Ephraim and Manasseh, but the whole nation would automatically have shared them at that time because, as he said, Ephraim and Manasseh were right there within those 12 tribes. But it was conditional. It was made unconditionally, the promise, the birthright promise, to Abraham and then to Isaac and then to Jacob. But then there were were conditions put on it for ancient Israel. Now, what was the the history? Let's go over to, uh, to Numbers now, the next book over. Numbers chapter 14. And we'll see what happened. Well, you know what happened really right away once they got into, um, once they got into the, the wilderness. They doubted God. They questioned God. I mean, they said initially, you can read this in Exodus 19 and Exodus 24, where there again, God spelled out the conditions and all of the people of Israel responded in the affirmative. They said, yes, we'll do it. Yes, we want those blessings. We will obey you. But Israel didn't follow through with those actions. They didn't obey God. They disobeyed God's commands. You can see in Exodus 32, I mean, not long after, they had just agreed to abide by those terms and conditions. They were there when Moses went away for a time. They were there then building a golden calf that they wanted to worship in place of God. That's what God said not to do. In Leviticus 26, we we read that. Well, here in Numbers 14, you move along further in the story about a year or two when God says to Moses, now you pick out a leading man from each of the 12 tribes and send them into the promised land to spy out the territory and to see what I'm about to give to the people of Israel. Those spies were gone for 40 days and they came back and all except for two of them, they gave this evil report They said, oh, we can never take the land. There's too many many armies in there. We'll be overrun. We're just like little grasshoppers compared to these big giants. And when Joshua and Caleb spoke up to say, no, we can take this in faith. God will deliver us. Well, the Israelites wanted to stone them. And God was very upset. God was angry with Israel. And notice what their, their punishment was. This is Numbers 14, verse 29. God says to them, Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. So God would not allow the older generation to enter into the promised land. Down in verse 34, it says, After the number of the days in which you searched the land, even 40 days, 
Each day for a year, God says, shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. So 40 wasn't some arbitrary figure that God just, just popped into his thinking. This was a, a day for a year that they were going to be punished. For each one of those days that they were spying out the land, God would punish them in the wilderness for 40 years, as it turns out. Now let's go look at another uh, covenant or another agreement uh, that God had made with King David. This is over in 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7 and, uh, and chapter, well, chapter 7 and verse, verse 12. Here we read about the, the royal throne that God established in King David. 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 says, And when your days, this is in the midst of, again, this, uh, this agreement that God made with David, this covenant, it says, And when your days be fulfilled and you shall sleep with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, which shall proceed out of your bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So God said he would establish David's throne forever. And what would happen then if Solomon or some of the other kings disobeyed or rebelled against God? How would God handle that? Well, he goes on to say that he would correct them. But notice verse 14 first. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. So God says, if he commits iniquity, I'll chasten him with the rod of men. But I won't break this covenant because I, I said I would establish that throne forever. Now, this book has quite a lot to say about that covenant as well, the Davidic covenant. And we've talked about that often on this program. There's so much packed into this. We can't cover all of the subjects today. Today, I want to focus more on the birthright promise, that covenant that God made with Abraham. But suffice it to say, I mean, God, God had a way that he would correct Solomon if he, did, if he did get caught up in sins, which he did, and yet still preserve that throne of David. Let me take you again back to the United States and Britain in prophecy. Again, speaking of Israel, as we move ahead in the story, they suffered under Saul, it says. They began prospering under King David. And in Solomon's reign, they reached a considerable state of prosperity. However, they had not yet flowered into the full, predominant world power status promised under the birthright. So did they get the birthright blessings during Solomon's day? It says, and Solomon's prosperity turned him to idolatry. Again, they were violating the condition for receiving the birthright. The answer is they didn't receive the birthright blessings, not during Solomon's day. And I think you probably are aware of what happened after Solomon, where the kingdom divided in two because of Solomon's sins. You had the ten northern tribes, and then you had the two southern ones that God preserved for David's sake, for Jerusalem's sake, for that throne of David's sake. One more quote here, it says, Now the birthright and scepter promises were divided into two nations. Remember, Ephraim and Manasseh shared the birthright. If it were then inherited, the others of the ten-tribe nation of Israel would have automatically shared in, in it with them, since they were part of the same nation. So the, the, the two divide, and you have the, the southern tribe of Judah, together with Benjamin, and God preserving the throne of David there. But then Ephraim and Manasseh went north with the northern tribes. And that's where Israel, the name Israel was. Did they receive it then anciently? Well, if you know the history there, both of them, both Israel and Judah, went into captivity. They never received the birthright blessings. They both went into captivity just as God prophesied. And he raised up the prophet Jeremiah to ensure that the throne of David, in the case of Judah, would be preserved because God had promised that. But what about the birthright promise? How did God... How did God ensure that the people of Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh specifically, how did he ensure that they received the birthright blessings? All of that and more is explained in this wonderful book, The United States and Britain in Prophecy. Make sure that you stay tuned so that you can request your free copy today. We'll be right back. The very best minds in the world are in total ignorance of the unprecedented cataclysm that is about to strike. And why have these prophecies not been understood or believed? 
because the vital key that unlocks prophecy to our understanding had been lost. That key is the identity of the United States and the British peoples in biblical prophecy. That key has been found. It is presented to those whose unprejudiced eyes are willing to see in this volume, the United States and Britain in prophecy. Email your request to td at kpcg.fm or visit thetrumpet.com. So as we've been discussing, ancient Israel did not follow through on those terms and conditions that God set forth for them to receive the birthright blessings. And so what did God do to punish them anciently and yet to keep his unconditional promise to Abraham? What did God do? Well, it's very similar to what happened when Israel was in the wilderness. He punished them for a, a certain length of time. Anciently, it was those 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness. Let's look, look again at, at Leviticus 26, and we'll drop down now. This is, again, the, the blessings and the cursings chapter. Remember how God said, if you do this, then I'll give you this. If, then. And then in verse 18, it says here, And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Now, as Mr. Armstrong covers in the United States and Britain in prophecy, seven times, if you study into the Hebrew, it can refer to the intensity of the curses, or it can refer to the length of the punishment. And in this case, it's talking about the duration. Let's just look over at uh, Revelation. We'll spin ahead to the very end of the book, Revelation chapter uh, 12, and we'll study for a moment uh, this, this subject of times. Seven times I'll punish you. What is a, a prophetic time? Well, let's note first, Revelation 12 and verse 6, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared of God, that they should feed her uh, there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And so, 1260 days, that's what's referred to here. Now, if you use the day for a year principle, which we studied in the first segment, uh, you can look into the history of the church and see where, where it, it did go into the wilderness for 1260 years, all through that time, uh, including the Middle Ages. But let's just focus in on, on 1260 for a moment. Let's go to chapter 13. This is Revelation 13 and verse 5. It says, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. Uh, this is speaking of the Holy Roman Empire. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, 42 months here is the same amount of time as that 1260 in Revelation 12. If you look at what a prophetic month is on God's sacred calendar, not on the Roman calendar, but on God's sacred calendar, it's 30 days and 42 months times 30 is 1260. It's the same, the same number. There's 360 days in a prophetic year or 30 days in a prophetic month. Now, let's go back to chapter 12 again. This is verse 14, it says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness. So here's the church again going into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. So throughout the passage, you see 1260, or you see 42 months. Here it says she's into the wilderness for a time, and times, and then half a time. So what could that be referring to? The same phrase, by the way, is used in, in the Old Testament. You can see that in Daniel 12 and verse 7. But what Mr. Armstrong explains in the United States and Britain in prophecy, and again, you can understand this. It may sound complicated with all these different terms and the numbers and, and then having to, to do some mathematics. But you can know and understand if you're willing to study that a prophetic time is talking about a year and then times is two more years and then half a time is uh, half a year, three and a half years, in other words. The same 1260, in other words. The same 1260 she's taken into that wilderness. Now, with respect to that Middle Ages period, it's a day for a year where it was 1260 years. But in the end time, it's talking about a literal 1260 day period or three and a half years, that time uh, that is the great tribulation when God will have to intervene on the affairs of this world to, to 
uh, protect his church. Notice, this is just from JFB commentary, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, putting together the numbers. It says, as Israel was in the wilderness 40 years, so the church for 42 months, three and a half years or times, or 1260 days. It's putting all these figures together, in other words, between the overthrow of Jerusalem and the coming of Jesus Christ. No, it's, it's right about that, that three and a half year period, culminating in the, the return of Jesus Christ. But now let's go back to Leviticus 26 and see how this applies to that birthright promise that God made to Abraham. And then the punishment, the punishment that came upon Israel because they refused to obey God's laws. This again is Leviticus uh, 26 and verse 18. And if you will not... Uh, yet for all of this, hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. As I covered earlier, that's talking about the duration or the length of the punishment. Seven times, God says, and a prophetic time in the Bible, as we've studied in the book of Revelation, it's a 360-day year. Seven times, 360, I'll punish you. Now, if you take the day-for-a-year principle, that we studied in Numbers 14, you can also see it in the, in the book of Ezekiel, that amounts to 2,520 years that you'll be punished. 2,520, seven times, seven times 360 equals 2,520. That's how long it would be delayed. And so when did this punishment start? Well, you can go back into 2 Kings 17 and see where Israel went into captivity. That's around 721 B.C and then count forward from there to see when that punishment would finally end. And then God would pour those blessings down upon the people of Israel. I've mentioned Mr. Armstrong in this book that he wrote. We'll play for you now a clip. This is from his old radio program where he's talking about uh, the withholding of those blessings, that birthright blessing, uh, and then when it would come down upon the people of Israel. Now, God had made the promise unconditionally to Abraham. God was bound to keep the promise, but he did it this way. He promised that the descendants of Abraham in the days of Moses, 400 years after Abraham, could have had the promise at that time if they had at that time obeyed God. Because he was their ruler, he set them up as his nation, he was their king, but it wasn't very long until they rejected him from being king, and they wanted a man to be a king, so they got Saul, and later David and David's dynasty, and so on. Well, they refused to obey God then, and so God took away this promise from them for 2,520 years, which carried from about 720 B.C. on down to 1800, or the very beginning of the 19th century A.D., and we, my friends, are the recipients of those very promises. We have been the head nation and not the tail. We have had every promise God ever made to Abraham fulfilled in our American people and the British Commonwealth, our British cousins, the British Commonwealth of Nations. Our peoples have received every blessing ever promised to Abraham. That's the truth. That's the truth. It's laid out in such detail in the United States and Britain in prophecy, as he just said there. I mean, if it's not the United States and Britain, who else is it? And if no one else received that, that birthright, then how can you even trust anything that God says in his word? He preserved the throne of David in the case of the Davidic covenant, and he sure did follow through on his birthright promise, giving it to all of our, our peoples the United States, and Britain in, in prophecy, our descendants, or the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh, I should say. We've been the recipients of all of this vast wealth and power, and really, as, as I said in the, in the first segment, it was a sudden skyrocketing to power from virtual obscurity. It didn't happen at, at or around 1800, when Britain went on to become this great and powerful empire. In the 1800s, I mean, that was the, the, the century for Great Britain. And then there was a, a relatively peaceful and smooth transition to the American century in the 1900s. And yet, what is happening to our nations uh, today? Let's look through, again, what Abraham Lincoln said about the blessings, all of the fabulous wealth 
that we received. He said, this is back in the 1800s, we find ourselves in the peaceful possession of the fairest portion of the earth as regards fertility of soil, extent of territory, and salubrity of climate. We find ourselves the legal inheritors of these fundamental blessings. We toil not in the acquirement or the establishment of them. I mean, we didn't, we didn't get these ourselves. We've been blessed. We've been given the choicest of blessings. And anyone with just a basic understanding of history would have to acknowledge this. It says further, this is when he issued the proclamation for prayer and fasting in 1863. He said, it's the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. He says, we have been the recipients of the choicest blessings of heaven. We've been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We've grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation ever has grown. But we have forgotten God. I'll have to leave it to you to go and read the rest of it. We've forgotten God, he said. We've forgotten God. And so what happens? What happens? I mean, if God's followed through and kept his promise, and we received all of these blessings, and now we're forgetting God. Well, you can go back and study Leviticus 26 and see what God says will happen if we don't obey, if we forget God. And we're seeing some of those very, very things happening already. Please, if you will, jot down the information you need so that you can get a free copy of the United States and Britain in prophecy and have so many of these prophecies and more laid out for you in such in such powerful detail. We've only been able to hit a few high spots here today, but contact our operators now and request the United States and Britain in prophecy. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.